So as some of you may know, I'm an atheist, a person who is not convinced in the existence of a higher intelligence, god, or deity based on lack of evidence provided by believers. Atheism is in no way a religion, saying that is a common tactic used by the religious to level the baggage that comes with believing in God. It's a false equivalence. Atheists have no doctrine, no ritual worship, symbolism, scripture, mythology, no secret objects, and especially no faith. Funny thing is though is that all monotheist religions are atheists to all other gods, and if not believing in a god was a religion, then you now practice two religions. Atheism is just as much as a religion as not collecting stamps as a hobby. Strictly laying out these definitions is important because people try to spin the position into something it's not. This video stems from conversations I've had recently with people of religious backgrounds and is the culmination of my thoughts up to this point on religion and the god concept throughout the years. And if you're easily triggered or too lazy to question your own beliefs or to actually think, I recommend you start here, as it will provide some new interesting ways of thinking. With that out of the way, let us continue. As most blacks are, I grew up Christian. This is awesome! Black God rules! For up until I was about 11 years old. Church every Sunday, Sunday school, communion, getting prayed on, reading the Bible itself, hearing the supposed way the world worked and how we got here, and actually thinking I had this connection with a higher being. However, with my name being George, I was in fact curious like the iconic character, and it was quite fitting because of how inquisitive I was of the things around me. From childhood, we were told little white lies to comfort us from the realities of the world, to give a simple reason to large complexities and to provide mystical explanations to seemingly mundane things to make us feel better or special. One popular example of that would be Santa Claus. Supposedly a fat white man rides in a floating sled powered by reindeer, knows exactly whose kids have been good or bad, and delivers presents through a chimney even to some kids without one. Once I simply questioned the notion of such, it was quite easy to see it was a lie. And once I'd applied that logical reasoning to my faith, it was quite easily revealed for what it was, just another their Santa story. The religious are brought into religion because it provides them false truths that appeal to the basics of the human mind, actively conning them. The appeal to human mortality with the claim of eternal life with heaven. The appeal to human depression with the claim that God is always here for you, looking out for you, doing good for you, when you've been wrongly convinced you can't get through life's problems on your own. The appeal to the human fear of the unknown and complexities of life subsided by saying God just works in mysterious ways or it's just God's divine plan. And finally, once they've gotten you entrapped, the deep-rooted fear of the false consequence of hell is what keeps you from leaving along with the quote-unquote personal experiences you've had living such lie. That's the problem of religion though. It stumps logical thinking and replaces it with a blind faith in things completely irrational while distorting reality to fit its own narrative. As for the concept of faith, faith relates to a strong belief in a god or the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than actual proof. Faith doesn't require empirical evidence for its strong conviction, but yet the feelings of the person who holds such beliefs. So it's essentially based on nothing at the root of it. Honestly, when you really get down to it, it's all about faith. Mm. It's something you feel, not something you can explain. It's very hard to put into words. Because it makes no sense. A theist might claim you need to have faith in evolution or the Big Bang, and that's simply wrong because all available evidence leads back to those explanations. None lead back to any god claim. We don't have faith in these explanations to be true. We know them to be true because we can demonstrate them. I know a pen will drop because it's been demonstrated time and time again and explained by the phenomenon we call gravity. See, that's why when theists have doubts, people of a religious council will tell them just to have faith instead of actually going out and questioning their position through a clear, unfiltered, unindoctrinated lens. And one thing I find funny is the discrediting regarding sciences in some instances of the religious defending their beliefs. Science is faulty or wrong when it doesn't support these divine claims, but has got it right when doctors are saving your life from terminal disease. How convenient. If we win by these ancient texts written thousands of years ago, we would have never progressed 
we still be stoning each other to death over minor infractions and dying to simple disease. Oh, but things like evolution are just a theory. Most people don't realize they're using the everyday definition of theory. Scientific theory is tested rigorously and mounds of evidence is collected before it is said to be the explanation of something. You know what? Gravity is also a theory, but I don't see you jumping out of windows, do I? And a little experiment, anybody discrediting science, is that if you ever get severely sick, just pray it'll go away. See how long you actually last. Your faith healers got you covered, right? If it doesn't work out for the kids who are terminally ill who die every year, the neglectful parents who propagate the notion that prayer works over actual medicine, I doubt it'll work for you. At Philadelphia Cemetery, most of the graves are marked, but not this spot where two small children are buried. Two children who would be alive today, say authorities, if their parents gave them medical care. Herbert and Catherine Scheibel are charged with third-degree murder following the death of their eight-month-old son, Brandon, this spring. Instead of caring and nurturing him, they ultimately caused his death by praying over his body instead of taking him to the doctor. Science always moves, changes, and adapts based on new formation and rigorous testing. Religion stays stagnant. You wouldn't trust medical science from 2,000 years ago. Why trust a book from that long ago, proclaiming how to live your life in current times, written by people who didn't even know what a germ was? And why follow it, especially when there's extreme examples of barbaric action and sheer ignorance within this book? Just picking and choosing, right? Choose to love thy neighbor and respect thy parents, but to stone gay people to death. Or the equivalent nowadays is to call them heathens and protest their entire existence and hate them because their God says to. There are many arguments that the religious propose for the existence of a god, but first we'll get into the absurdity of the god concept itself. Most gods follow the tri-omni classification of all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving slash morally just and good, these tri-omnis being logically impossible. For example, with these attributes, the component of free will is false. If god is all-knowing, he knows exactly what will happen from the start, constituting a divine plan that is unchanging, so he knows the decisions you'll make from the start and what will happen as a result. Meaning from conception of your life, everything is set in stone. Meaning some people are destined for hell and some are destined for heaven. Some for a glorious life and some for a torturous one. Meaning every school shooting was supposed to happen, every child raped was supposed to happen, every murder was supposed to happen, every loved one inflicted with disease was supposed to happen, and every cataclysmic event known to mankind was supposed to happen. All a part of God's plan, which apparently we cannot comprehend as mere humans even though it's clearly flawed. And under this aspect of quote-unquote free will, life in that sense doesn't exist. Even your thoughts are predetermined. Me making this video and you watching it are predetermined. And let's say we do grant the idea of actual free will. This directly contradicts the all-knowing aspect because God wouldn't know the future of our actions. He'd have to see them play out and judge them accordingly. As for being all-powerful and morally just less good or caring or loving, whatever you call it, those two are as easily dismissed. Say God isn't all-knowing and free will actually exists. Let's say a complete genocide of the majority of living things on earth is about to happen through a meteor, killing all creeds of people, religious, non-religious, the likes. If your god knows this will happen and is apparently all-powerful and does nothing, then he's not morally just good or caring. He is in fact evil or at the very least does not care about human suffering. And if he is willing to stop it, but not able to, why call him a god? If your god has the power to stop a child from getting raped and doesn't, your god is not good. Because if you had the power, you would stop it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just sit there and watch, and then later let your followers somehow constitute this as being part of a divine plan under your supervision. Because simply ask yourself this question, what good comes from this kind of suffering, other than the sadistic enjoyment of the person watching and not acting against it with the powers they supposedly hold? As for the believers proclaiming these holy books to be a guide on morality, I'd say that's a thing that also needs to be addressed. Based on the barbaric actions within these books and what is considered right and wrong, I heavily question anybody who actually looks in these books to be a better person. 
A person might say if you don't believe in a god, how can you be moral? It's quite simple. In the primitive sense, morality is just a word we as humans use to describe the biological trait that humans survive better in cohabilitation states. This is because we are a social species, much like other animals. We work together to better the human race and to keep it from going extinct, and to fulfill our biological purpose to pass on our lineages. A more humanized version of this comes into saying, treat others how you want to be treated, just not in the sense that you're hurting anybody. And ask yourself this, in the sense of absolute morality with the God concept, would it be moral if God told you to kill your mother by stabbing her 27 times? Most sane people would say no morality and what is considered right or wrong changes on the situation there are no absolutes and also ask yourself this if there was no god would you immediately go out and kill people if you were sane you would say no if you can't determine right from wrong you lack empathy not religion and looking in the bible for what's considered right or wrong doesn't really stack up when you don't skip over the parts your pastor tells you not to read let's read some verses if a man so happens to meet a virgin who was not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. Now what kind of lunatic makes a rape victim marry her attacker? Answer? God, of course. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground their pregnant woman ripped open. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. If in spite of this, you still do not listen to me but continue to be hostile toward me, and then in my anger I will be hostile towards you, and I myself will punish you for your sins ten times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols. I will abhor you. If a man lies with a male as a woman, both of them shall be put to death for their abominable deed. They have forfeited their lives. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at that time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So said the Lord, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them can't forget about the time where God fucked up so bad that he had to eradicate all of humanity, man, woman, child, and all animals to apparently restart even though he is perfect and can do no wrong and make no mistake. He picked his favorite family to find all that wood somehow in the middle of the fucking desert that would require thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men to actually build, and this ark would somehow take all animals including insects because they're animals too, and that would include termites that eat wood. And this would somehow account for animals that weren't even close to Israel geographically in any way that required different and specific environments to even live. And somehow got all these animals to not kill each other. But I digress. The Lord said to Moses, take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you will be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the people, arm some of your men to go to war against the Midianites so that they may carry out the Lord's vengeance on them. Send into battle a thousand men from each of the tribes of Israel. The Israelites captured the Midianite women and children and took all the Midianite herds, flocks, and goods as plunder. They burned all the towns where the Midianites had settled as well as all their camps. They took all the plunder and spoils including the people and animals and brought the captives, spoils, and plunder to Moses and Eleazar. Have you allowed the woman to live? He asked them. They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save yourself every girl who has never slept with a man. 
this was a holy war commanded by God led by two of his highest disciples to pillage, conquer, and plunder people who didn't follow that particular God. All boys were slaughtered and all virgin girls were to be kept alive and taken as slaves, primarily sex slaves which you can tell they were by the emphasis on virgin girls. All of this permitted because apparently they led some of God's holy Israelite people astray. Now put your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, any relative you hold dear in the place of the Midianites. Is this holy action still moral and just? Be honest with yourself answering that question because this is the same justification used by terrorists similar to the ones who struck the Twin Towers on 9-11. If you don't believe, you die. <laughs> This moves me on to the fate of non-believers with eternal punishment, aka hell, and this is one that always trips up believers. I ask them flat out, do you think good people, such as myself, deserve eternal punishment? Some flat out say yes, revealing their true insidious nature, but some are as disingenuous as to say, it's not up to me. I then ask them more directly, I'm a non-believer. According to your God, all non-believers deserve eternal torture. Do you agree with your God that I deserve eternal torture. They freeze and conjure up a sickening delusion that you somehow send yourself to hell. They fail to realize that their God is the one in which who makes these broken rules and is the one in which who sends the person to hell upon this sickening judgment. I legitimately question a person who can say they truly love or value me when their belief system is as flawed as to say that for not believing in something that has shown no evidence of its existence, I somehow deserve eternal punishment and that is somehow my fault even though their God is the one who set up the conditions in the first place. It's a sickening notion that someone as sick as a child or rapist could just repent absolving them of all their sin, gaining them a one-way ticket to eternal paradise, but an unbeliever completely rational in their thoughts who does not repent is somehow below someone of that nature. The only apparent sin that Christ cannot absolve you from is non-believing. How convenient. Believe or burn. Sickening options from an all-loving and all-forgiving God. Religion easily has the greatest bullshit story ever told. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man <laughs> living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day. And the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these 10 things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. And one of the sickest things in the Bible that Christian apologists like to dismiss is slavery. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them as sincerely as you would serve Christ. However, you may purchase the male or female slaves from among the foreigners who live among you. You may also purchase the children of such resident foreigners, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat your slaves like this, but never the people of Israel, your relatives. Notice the clear distinction between God's holy people, the Israelites, and the foreigners. When a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod so hard that the slave dies under his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, the slave survives for a day or two, he is not to be punished since the slave is his own property. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows, but the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and for the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So it's fully permitted by the God of the Bible that it is okay to buy foreign slaves and beat them as long as they don't die in a couple of days. And 
and pass them on as your permanent inheritance forever. Instead of condemning it outright, like he does something as arbitrary as homosexuality, he instead regulated this evil action. Apologists would like to say it was voluntary, or a way in which to pay off a debt, but that's just a twisted delusion of what was actually happening. And some might say they will be free in six years, but this is in relation to the verse on Hebrew slaves. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone, but if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and does not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. This is a purposeful misrepresentation between the distinction between Hebrew slaves and foreign slaves. All slaves can be bought and beaten, but foreign slaves can be inherited for life. Hebrew slaves, while they can go free after six years, the loophole in which a slave master could give him a wife and if they have kids, the slave master gets to keep the kids and the slave's wife for life, but most men would want to keep in touch with their children or wife, meaning it is very easy for a slave master to entrap an entire family. This is just outright sick. No matter which way you try and spin this, no matter what context, you try and proceed from the situation, you cannot justify slavery of any kind. And what gets me is the fact that there are so many black Christians who either don't know about this or are fully aware of it and try to dismiss it as vehemently as they can because we've been told to or because it's too hard to mentally question the supposed unquestionable. The thing is, Christianity was a beat into the heads of black people. The submission to that of a specific higher power is a remnant of being told that we cannot do anything on our own because at one point, we couldn't do anything at all. It's a coping mechanism for the injustice of slavery, which ironically is completely permissible by that same God. Funny, huh? As a black man, I could never adhere to Christianity, let alone a God, let alone another master. See, religious people never actually take a step back and analyze the absurdity of the books they hold so dear, and once they do find a little bit of something controversial, they tap down to around it or make silly excuses. One funny thing I've seen, at least in the base Christian denomination, is how dumb the supposed resurrection of Jesus Christ actually is, and that's one of the main selling points. So tell me, you don't see a problem with the notion that your God essentially sacrificed himself onto himself in human form that so he could forgive you for the way he made you, and then brought himself back to life so you could worship him all your life for dying for the sin he gave you based on the scenarios he made in the beginning of time that led up to this point exactly he didn't give his only begotten son as a sacrifice because it was him and even if jesus was detached from god he still came back to life it wasn't an actual sacrifice and all of this sin is apparently caused by a woman getting deceived by a talking snake that god would have known was there in the first place to deceive them and would know the actions of adam and Eve before they even did them. Come on now. It's manipulation at best and faulty writing by the people who made this nonsense at worst. People of faith like this are told they are born sick and twisted and unworthy of love and the only way to be saved is to be commanded well by some god who they should love but also fear. But love is not fear though and fear disguised as love is deceptive abuse. 
To argue with God through theology or holy texts is to retain illogical absurdities, wild, unimaginable rules and concepts, cherry-pick certain aspects, and disregard the man-made flaws within a supposed perfect book. To argue a personal God without theology is the ultimate form of egoism. To count your blessings when you pray and find your car keys, but to disregard the millions of people dying in the most horrific ways before you even get a chance to blink in the morning. And finally, to argue a deistic God, a creator where no intervention or sympathy for human life or suffering is just to misrepresent the universe for what it really is. Now there are many arguments used to defend the God concept, the main ten I've seen over and over and over again that have been refuted time and time again throughout centuries include, firstly, the cosmological, which boils down to saying, there must be a mover to initiate the movement of the universe, or there must be a causation for the universe. This argument doesn't actually lead to a God, let alone a specific God, or just one God, so we have a mover or a causation for the parameters of the universe. That doesn't tell us anything about the supposed mover or or causation. The mover could be anything in that place. A toaster, a leprechaun, a timeless human soul, and it satisfies the argument equally as well as a theistic god. And with this, we have to ask the question, why does this supposed mover have to love its creation? Why does it have to have consciousness? Why does it have to have emotion? These human characteristics. A leaf doesn't fall based on its own volition, it falls based on gravity, and the initial mover or causation could be as dehumanized as the Big Bang. Throwing out the man-made books of what this supposed that God is, the furthest I'll give anybody is deism, but even then, the evidence for that interpretation is little to none. As far as the observable world, the only God or cause there actually is to be noted would be the Big Bang, a natural occurrence that does not care or have feelings to care for what it so happens to cause. People want this mover or causation to have human characteristics because they are scared of reality and our general insignificance in this huge universe. Next up, the God of the Gaps argument. The argument that because there are things currently unexplainable by science, there must be a God to fill those gaps. This is wrong logically because taking for example the fact that before humans knew where thunder and lightning came from, it was presumably God's wrath, and if you were Greek, it was Zeus's wrath, and when it rained, it was God's tears, when in reality, when man decided not to be lazy and shock it up to their own superstitions, we figured out to the T of how thunder and lightning came to be, and and the same with rain with the water cycle, disproving the falsehood of religion had proclaimed to be the answer which wasn't based on actual demonstrable evidence, just superstition, which is a thing that's very common among religion. I mean in the Christian bible the earth is apparently flat and laying on pillars, or how in the Quran apparently Muhammad flew on a magical winged horse. Now tell me if that makes any sort of sense to you. Just because there are certain gaps in scientific knowledge does not mean you get to claim the God claim, especially a specific one out of all 4,000 and growing gods. It's a common saying for believers trying to scare more people into their sick game is that what if you're wrong? What if this god does exist? You've betted with your life and lost everything while I've betted with mine and won it all. And it's kind of a sick thing that people even attempt to bring this up because it implies an all loving god would apparently have enough capacity to hate you enough to send you to an infinite fiery torturey hell forever for not sucking his dick. And it's even worse because theists actually bring this up without even realizing how how horrific it actually is and some even tout it like oh yeah you're going to hell to burn forever yeah how loving is that and this argument is essentially pascal's wager a quite measly argument at this point because i say back to the believer what if you're wrong out of all 4,000 plus and growing gods how do you determine that your god based on where you were born geographically or are indoctrinated into believing is apparently the one true god a thing i like to do to end conversations with theists is to say if i do end up burning in hell it was just too cold in hell but the thing I choose to leave out if I feel like being nice that day is that they'll be burning too, just in a different God's hell. And what if we pick the wrong religion? Every week we're just making God madder and madder. 
And next up, the intelligent design slash watchmaker slash look at the trees argument. This argument basically entails that because of the complexities of life, such as the human body, it must lead to an intelligent designer. That intelligent designer being God. The intelligent design argument is shot down as soon as you take into consideration evolution in the formation of nature and its processes. You may say, yes, these things are incredibly complex, but they weren't always. We didn't always have legs or eyes. Millions of variations came before that. Even the earth had variation. There was a time in which the earth had no oxygen or water. Cataclysmic events such as earthquakes and tornadoes were paramount. It was basically an uninhabitable place for life. The earth wasn't designed for us. We just adapted to what it became. And if it was designed for us so perfectly, the earth wouldn't be trying to kill us constantly and in new ways every single year. I mean, there are literally 10,000 diseases that grow and mutate to kill us every day. Even our bodies weren't intelligently designed when you think about it. I mean, your appendix could literally burst at random while you listen to this and you could die slowly and painfully from an overflow of bacteria into your body. And you may say something like a car or a watch is complex as well, however, we know in the observable natural world that humans create such things but once you start applying that logic of intelligent design by a god it becomes dangerous because it's a false analogy we have evidence a watchmaker created a watch but none that a god created the universe and with this you have to ask the question who created god's god and that question would lead to the God is eternal argument. But that means if a God is eternal, that means it's possible for an intelligent mind to exist without a creator. And therefore, the atheist disbelief that our mind was intelligently designed is a perfectly reasonable stance based on the consistency and fact that human minds were the result of evolution and taking into consideration the contrary lack of evidence that it was created by a specific deity. Saying God is eternal is just an exemption of logic and a cop out from actually explaining the blatant inconsistency of the argument which leads to the question of who created God's God and so forth and so forth and so forth but it stops once you realize there's no sufficient evidence for the first God ever existing Next up, the anecdotal argument. Anecdote of an account not necessarily true or reliable because based on personal accounts rather than facts or research, anecdotals are not adequate evidence or proof for the existence of a god or anything really. Say for example, someone says cigarettes doesn't lead to lung cancer and then they say their evidence for that conclusion is that their grandparents smoked for 90 years and never once was diagnosed with cancer. This disregards all scientific evidence that directly correlates smoking to cancer. You can't just say something is because you see an exception that does not make it the rule just think if anecdotal evidence was only used in legal cases say 50 people supposedly saw a man commit a murder if the investigative teams only took those 50 people's accounts as evidence then the man with the actual blood on his hands identical to the man who was murdered would be let go 50 or even in millions people's suspicions can be entirely wrong scientific evidence is always needed for an exact conclusion not hearsay or what what you think it to be. Anecdotals aren't the plural of evidence. Anecdotal arguments lead us to the personal experience argument, and in which I'll have to tell you straight up, the fact that your religion might have helped you cope with something or change your life for the better or whatever it is, is not in any capacity evidence for the existence of a god, let alone a specific one. You feeling that you had these supposed personal experiences with your god does not equate it to being real. Say for example you heard a strange voice in your head that you equate to being god. In no way does this imply an external source actually Spoke to you. The human brain can be surprisingly good at coming up with different voices and scenarios. I mean, we do it all the time when we're reading. See, religion and belief in the God concept imposes a schizophrenic attitude by training you to dissociate with your own mentality, or rather associate everything you think with whatever deity they're trying to push onto you. You are now not able to distinguish your own mentality and thought processes from the imaginary perception of a God imposed onto you and your own thinking. An internal conversation is a monologue, not a dialogue. You can claim anything on these experiences, such as aliens existing because you saw them in your sleep, or because you attribute a bright light in the sky to be a UFO. Your strong convictions do not bend reality. Your feelings do not have an effect on fact. 
and before you bring out your holy book, let's not commit the circular reasoning fallacy or using the Bible to prove the Bible to prove the existence of a god. That's more than easily disbanded once you realize that all of these holy texts are myths passed on, rewritten, translated, retranslated, are copies of each other, take inspiration from each other, have inherent prophecies, revelations, and stories, and even overarching themes and characters all akin to each other. That in which sometimes predate the ones you proclaim to be the one true god or religion. Those other gods and religions that aren't yours aren't false. They have just as much pure conviction from their believers and just as much evidence and validity as yours which is none your bible verses don't prove anything just as the harry potter books don't equate to voldemort existing just as the tombs of the egyptian gods don't equate them to having any divinity or the shrines of the Hindu gods, which in fact predated Christianity by thousands of years, or the ancient cave drawings of Neanderthals don't equate to their gods either, just their delusions. If the Norse gods have been forced, beaten into, and fought over just as much as the Christian gods in America, most people would be worshipping Odin, the father of all gods in Greek mythos. Religiosity obeys borders, the truth does not. Next up, the prophecies argument. Prophecies aren't proof for the existence of a god simply because they are vague predictions that can be tied to anything. And when something similar plays out, people just cherry pick things that will try and substantiate that vague point and throw out the other factors that don't substantiate it. A classic example of confirmation bias. And just think for a second of all the failed prophecies and quote unquote fulfilled prophecies by other different religions, it's all contradictory. Such as the end times prophecies, which are laughably rebranded every time one of them doesn't work. I mean, the end times are first this day, then this day, the 2000s, 2012, and so on and so forth. To the religious, we're always in the end times every single year. Another common prophecy is that their supposed deity will come back one day, and of course all of them fall flat on their head every time. I mean, Jesus was supposed to come back a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure the millions of disciples who died before he could come back are pretty mad that he pretty much stood them up for thousands of years. He's had 2,000 years to come back and hasn't shown his face once. Looks like your gods are playing in the ultimate game of hide and go seek, and they appear to be world champions. To have an actual prophecy claim even come close to being reasonable is something exactly specific played out frame by frame with timestamps, exact names of people, the exact weather, exact location, exact clothes, exact date and time period, and a hell of a whole lot more information and details. And then, even if we did grant the prophecy claim, that still does not lead us to the existence of a god. I mean, you don't call the weatherman a prophet for predicting it's gonna rain on Saturday night, do you? And you don't call the Simpsons God for predicting another thing that might happen in the future, do you? Ambiguity in any capacity automatically disqualifies a supposed prophecy. And for the people proclaiming to receive prophecy through this power or a prophetic word, then we also have to ask the question, if the prophecy of let's say a school shooting was apparently beamed down into your head, why would your God tell you it was gonna happen in the first place? Because going against it, even slightly just by telling a random person on the street and you going against that plan is going against your god which you love with such conviction and you know where going against him apparently gets you a one-way ticket to hell damned if you do damned if you don't and on top of that prophecies don't really tie too well with the whole free will thing considering a prophecy means a predetermined unchanging future and finally, which is a very popular argument, the miracles argument. Miracles are not proof for the existence of a god. They're pretty much misinterpreted events labeled through confirmation bias. Let's say a plane crash happens of a hundred people, and supposedly the only survivor is a one-year-old child. How can we distinguish a miracle from an extremely rare anomaly? And is the entire other coalition of people dying? part of this miracle? Is the extreme torment part of this holy action? And even if we did grant this miracle claim, your god has a lot of explaining to do for selectivity, healing you of a headache when you got prayed on that one time, but allows children's hospitals to run rampant with kids dying of terrible disease in the most painful ways imaginable, or doing something so absurd like saving only one child out of a hundred people on a plane. Also, we have to ask the question, how can we distinguish a miracle from an unlikely rare natural occurrence that we are yet to comprehend. 
for example, before humans knew how Caesars worked, we just assumed it was demons controlling somebody's body in our moments of ignorance. Our failure to find the actual explanation to something does not allow us to put the ultimatum of a god onto it. Because first, we'd have to demonstrate direct correlation to the event to the god and then demonstrate the actual god itself. Which again, you can't. You can only assume and assert. And you see how that doesn't work. You saying I can't explain this magically becomes it can't be explained then it becomes it has been explained the gods did it it's a paradoxical assertion that i don't know therefore i do know which makes absolutely no sense and on top of that all investigated miracle claims are proven false once scientifically examined and one thing to point out finally is that you don't see miracles of amputees or growing limbs do you but yet you see things that can be easily faked or you see things with a general low probability of happening being labeled as something else say for example a magician pulls a rabbit out of thin air you don't automatically assume he has some kind of magic power or that it was a miracle especially when it's quite easy easy to find out how he actually did it. Placebo was powerful, and deception is the ties that bind. And once you figure out how the magician pulls his tricks, he can no longer deceive. In conclusion to all of this, it's clear to anybody actually thinking through a non-indoctrinated brain what these holy texts and the god concept actually were, a way of explaining the unexplainable at the time, without knowing a lick of the truth. Also while giving commands to control the people around them whose governments enforced it, or by way of people who actively accepted it because they were scared of the unknown, created by barbaric bloodshed craving savages in no way close to being objectively moral, who permitted things like murder, slavery, rape, pillaging of anybody who didn't worship their god, or in other words, people who didn't follow their governmental rules, savagery and ignorance under the veil of an all-loving, all-powerful, always-present being, that being, being man himself. We essentially are God. Sick, evil, and twisted, but also nice, compassionate, and loving. It's clear that no deity made us in their image, but we made these deities in our image. God is nothing more than an extension of the man's ego. They say to non-believers that if you don't believe, why do you care so much? Simply because religion poisons the well in which all humans are drinking from. From the countless holy wars fought to spread ignorance, from the burning of supposed witches in the Salem witch trials, to the modern hatred of homosexuals and hate crimes committed to them, to the persecution and even killing of non-believers in some countries, to the rationalizations of slavery, to the misrepresentation of science, and the indoctrination of our young thinkers which affects all minds to come for generations. We'll stop the supposed persecution, which is really a retaliation of ignorance, once it stops trying to bend the confines of reality to fit the person's irrational delusions in modern day fairy tales. To close, I ask one simple question. Will you stay gullible and blindly believe, or will you wake up and think?